finish our discussion on water resources. But before we do that, I want to make a correction. So I was looking through the audio file I made for the first half of this discussion, and I noticed that when we were looking at the picture of the major aquifers of the U.S., I pointed to New York and I said Texas. Not sure why I did that. My geography is bad, but it's not that bad. So I just wanted to clear that up. Uh, that upper uh, Midwestern highly productive aquifer stretches from New York in the east, not Texas, to Montana in the west. And that was all deposited during the last ice age uh, by the movement of glaciers. So I just wanted to clear that up before we begin today. And so today, we're going to really talk about water use and some of the major problems facing us today in regards to water. And I first start with looking at water use on a global scale. And so you can actually see here, so from region, obviously Asia both withdraws and consumes the most water. And that should make sense, especially when you talk about India and China here, major centers of population density. Um, North America is second. Now that should come as a little bit of a surprise because North America does not have the second largest population uh, density. In fact, we have about four and a half to five percent of the total population, yet we withdraw and consume the second greatest amount of water. And that's especially here in the U.S where we tend to waste a lot of water. But you can see then Europe, uh, Africa, South America, America, and minor uses in Australia. Now, this is what the picture looks like um, over time. So this is from 1900 to a projection to 2025. You can see the dark blue line here. That's the world's average. So back in 1900, they were consuming about 600 billion cubic meters per year, uh, and that's projected to rise to over 5,000 within the next couple of years. The black line is Asia, once again, the, the greatest use of water, but here's North America. And going all the way back to 1900, we have been the second greatest user of water, and yet we only have uh, a very small percentage of the total global population. Now this is what it looks like on a state scale. So this is um, water withdrawal, well, uh, how much water we withdraw in millions of gallons per day. The number one state is California, and that should make sense. High population density, and a large agricultural area, especially in the Imperial Valley. Texas is the second greatest user of water. They have high population density. Not sure why people want to live in Texas, but okay. Uh, they also have agriculture. They have cattle. If you've ever really thought about how much water a cow drinks in its lifetime, it's substantial. And then think about it, they also have oil refineries. And to refine crude oil into gasoline and other products requires a huge amount of water. A third, I am unfortunate to say, is Illinois, the state uh, where I was born and raised. Uh, once again, high population density, especially in the north region, and then a lot of agricultural as well. Nevada, we're on the low end of things out here because we really only have two population centers here in Clark County and up in Reno. And most of our water use isn't agriculture. It would be for mining. That's where most of our use comes from. Now, when it comes to water uses, there's two major types, in-stream and off-stream. Now, an in-stream water use is any use where the water does not leave the stream channel or the source. Uh, examples of this would include hydroelectric power. Think about it. We dam a river 
we bring in the water to turn a turbine and generate electrical current when we're done we release that water right back into the channel so it never left it entered the dam but it never left the channel transportation think of the hundreds of barges that go up and down the mississippi river every single day are they using that water yes did it leave the channel no and then recreational uses we've all gone swimming in the colorado river we've used the water but it didn't leave the channel that's an in-stream use now of the two by far the biggest are off-stream uses this is where water does leave the channel now off-stream water use is divided into two major types consumptive uses and non-consumptive uses a consumptive use is one is any use where the water is used and then lost to us. Let me give you an example of this, okay? And, and actually the biggest consumptive use of water is for irrigation. Let's think it's a hot August day and we're in Nebraska and we're spraying down our cornfield. Think about where the majority of that water uses. So we spray it on that cornfield. Most of it is either transpired used by the plants and then returned to the atmosphere or it evaporates back into the atmosphere now once it evaporates or transpires or evapotranspiration remember it's lost to us we don't have that water to use again that's a consumptive use it's still in the hydrologic cycle but it's lost to us uh, from being used again now a non-consumptive is a use in which we capture clean the used water and then reuse it so in non-consumptive think about this when you brush your teeth or take a shower that water goes to a water treatment facility is clean to a specific standard and then that water is reused often again and again and again that's a non-consumptive use so it leaves the channel and then it is used it's captured and reused again now remember we talked about this um, if we look at water use so the eastern half of the u.s they get most of their water remember from aquifers from groundwater the western or west of the rockies remember we don't have those aquifer uh, resources so we get a lot of ours from surface water now let's look at overall use in the US. So back in 2010, uh, and I know that's a little dated, but I haven't been able to find a more recent statistic. But in 2010, we consumed 355 billion gallons per day. That's per day. That's not our yearly use. That's how much we were using every single day. Now of that, the biggest use is for power generation. So if we look at this um, uh, pie over here, the yellow right here, that's for power generation, the biggest water use. Second biggest water use is this green slice, that's irrigation. And then the other big slice, this purple right here, that's public supply. Now we have others as well, mining, industrial uses, aquaculture, um, domestic, but those are the three biggest uses, power generation, irrigation, and public supply. Now, the good news for power generation is that's usually a non-consumptive use. We use it, we recapture it, we clean it up, and we reuse it again. However, the irrigation, that's a consumptive use, okay? And so often that water then it's part of the hydrologic cycle, but it's lost to us from using it again. Now, in southern Nevada, we used about 200 gallons per person per day from a 2015 study. Think about that, guys. Every single one of us in the valley, on average, we're using 200 gallons per day. Now, when you look at our use here in southern Nevada, the biggest use is public supply. So this blue here, single family residential, that would be homes, 
and multifamily residential that would be apartment complexes that's where most of our water use goes to um, eight percent goes to resorts about 13 to industrial uses and then uh, about six percent to golf courses so you can think of this 13 percent here actually it'd be more like 14 percent to our tourism industry both resorts and golf courses uh, that's a fairly large chunk of our use now as I was saying just a couple minutes ago we don't have the groundwater resources that they do in the east and so 90 percent of our water supply here in Clark County comes from Lake Mead which is then fed by the Colorado River now that amounts or I should say it did amount to about 97 billion gallons per year if you'll notice uh, uh, I think it was this spring they actually declared an emergency and so the western states that get their water from the Colorado haven't been able to take out their full allotment and if you've been to Lake Mead recently you know why that thing is just dropping feet multiple feet per month we are having uh, unfortunately a whole confluence of things are coming together uh, first our growing population here in Las Vegas and then the fact that we have been under drought conditions since 2000 some are actually classifying what we have right now as a mega drought and once again if you've been to Lake Mead I actually on this slide say there's a hundred and thirty foot drop that was actually a couple years ago when I made this slide uh, I think right now um, we're actually looking at 150, 155 foot drop in Lake Mead. And it's getting worse every single month. Now the problem is, is that this mega drought combined with these um, growing populations. If you look at the U.S., the two fastest growing cities are Phoenix and Las Vegas. Both of them in a desert biome, lack of water, and so they're withdrawing all of this water that isn't being resupplied because we're not getting our annual uh, precipitation. The snow melt is, is less than normal. And so this is really putting a strain on the entire water supply. Now, remember, it's not just us that withdraws water from the Colorado. So six Western states, including New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, California, which is probably the biggest user, uh, and um, Wyoming all withdraw a certain amount of water from the Colorado, and Mexico does the same thing. So we're dealing with a lot less water because of these changes to the hydrologic cycle brought on by climate change and then we exasperate that problem with these growing population centers that are demanding more water. Now, 90% of the water that we um, use in Lake Mead comes from um, snow melt in what is called the upper basin. So you can see the upper basin stretches from Utah, New Mexico, Colorado into Wyoming. So we have the uh, uh, Sierra Nevada we have the Rocky Mountains here and so during the winter months all that that solid precipitation falls in the upper elevations and then during the spring that melts is then fed into um, the Colorado by all these tributaries which then eventually flows into Lake Mead but once again since 2000 so over 20 years we've been in this drought or this mega drought condition and so we're seeing a lot less snow melt which means we see a lot less water in the Colorado River so less water more people very serious problem now just to show you how bad it's gotten um, this is the inner Las Vegas Bay both of these pictures are taken looking uh, northwest 
So this is what the bay looked like on March 7, 2000, where the elevation was 1213. Now, I've circled two rocks here, this rock and this rock, so you compare it to this bottom picture. So this rock here is the same one in this picture, and this rock here is the same one here. Notice 12 years later, in 2012, the elevation had dropped 90 feet, and this is what the picture looked like. And it's only gotten worse in the 10 years since that. Once again, mega drought conditions. Most um, hydrologists are classifying what we're in. And, and just to give you some idea, our average annual precipitation in Las Vegas is about eight, eight and a half inches per year. Since 2000, we're actually seeing only about four. So have our normal precipitation. And last year, 2021, I don't know if you remember this, but there was, I think it was over 240 days with lack of measurable precipitation. We went over 240 days without precipitation. Once again, okay, growing population, um, linked with the impacts of climate change are causing very serious problems here. Now these are our water trends through time and I really want you to pay attention to three colors. Those are, remember, the three biggest uses. Green is irrigation, yellow is power generation, and the purple here is public supply. So 1950 to 2005, notice back in the 50s irrigation was the biggest user of water and then the mid 60s power generation took over and has remained number one and irrigation has remained number two now notice through time as our the population of the u.s has increased public supply has also increased as well now when we talk about water use we need to talk about something called virtual water now this is water that isn't make-believe virtual water is water that is embedded in the production of agricultural or industrial products what we mean by that is it takes water to make certain industrial products or in the case of agriculture Think about how much water a cotton plant absorbs before it's picked, or how much water a chicken or a cow uh, or a pig drink over their entire lifetime. This is virtual water. Now this is different than what we call direct or overt water use. Direct use would be water we use for irrigation, for public supply. Okay. Uh, or for power generation. This is water embedded in these products that we really don't think about. Okay. For example, when you eat a hamburger at In-N-Out or McDonald's or wherever, you stop to consider how much water that cow drank over its entire lifetime before it was slaughtered. Of course you don't. But in that hamburger or in those leather boots or in that chicken or eggs or milk or um, cotton products is water built into the creation of those products that's virtual water and the problem is most people don't think about it even though it can add up fairly quickly now I want to give you some examples here and let's start with one that I think we all can can wrap our heads around it requires 1500 gallons of potable fresh water to process one barrel of beer now let's just imagine, let's just picture how many barrels of beer do you think are consumed on the strip on a holiday weekend? It's a lot, isn't it? Uh, it requires just under 63,000 gallons of water to produce one ton of steel. Now think about all the steel that went into building all those casinos on the strip. Now I've saved the best example for last. We've spent a, a, a great deal of time talking about energy and oil. It takes 1,851 gallons of water to refine one barrel of crude oil. Think about that. And remember the st st statistics I gave you. Uh, 
couple years ago, we were consuming, I think it was about 19.5 million barrels a day. So 19.5 million, multiply that by 1,851, and that's how much water we were using per day for that one year. It adds up quickly, and yet nobody really thinks about when you use these products that have water embedded in them. Now, what I want to do now is I want to switch gears. And I want to talk about the four biggest problems facing us today in regards to water. And so the first one we're going to talk about is something called groundwater erosion. Now, remember this. Groundwater doesn't just sit there. It moves driven by energy or hydraulic head. Remember, high hydraulic head to low hydraulic head. Well, as that groundwater moves, remember your high school physics. Anything that has mass and moves exerts a force. And so as groundwater is moving through what are called soluble rocks, that word soluble simply means dissolvable. So there is a group of sedimentary rocks called carbonate rocks. These carbonate rocks are soluble. So as the groundwater moves through them, it dissolves the material bit by bit by bit. Now, given enough time, a small crack can be enlarged and over thousands, tens of thousands, even millions of years, that small crack in the rocks can be expanded. This is how we get caves or caverns. So Monmouth Caves in Kentucky, or if you've been to Carlsbad Caves in New Mexico, that's how those things were created. They were created by groundwater dissolution over a long period of time. Now here's where uh, it, this creates a hazard for us. These caverns or these voids can become large enough to affect the surface. And this is where we create sinkholes and subsidence. So here's how a sinkhole forms. So we have this cavern in the subsurface that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so the support for the ceiling gets less and less and less the bigger the cavern gets. Eventually the support is going to be non-existent so that the ceiling collapses creating this depression that we call a sinkhole. The other issue we create, which we also talked about in our um, mining portion, was subsidence. So as those caverns get bigger and bigger and bigger, causes the material to collapse, which then causes the material on top to either slowly or suddenly settle. Remember that was subsidence, the gradual or sudden sinking or settling of the Earth's surface. Now, remember, that can then create engineering problems. If we have houses or buildings or roads built on that, that's going to create cracks and engineering problems where the uh, structure may be condemned. We have to knock it all down and start over. This is also creates an area called springs. Now, a spring is simply an area where groundwater flows out at the Earth's surface. Now a lot of people think that that word spring means high quality as far as um, in terms of uh, water. So a lot of people will, will drink spring water because they think it's better for themselves. No, a spring is simply where groundwater flows out at the Earth's surface. I have seen a black spring and believe me you would not want to drink that water. So that word spring says nothing about quality, ladies and gentlemen. It's simply groundwater that flows out at the Earth's surface. Now, these areas where we have caves and caverns and sinkhole and subsidence potential and where groundwater flows out at the Earth's surface, we refer to these areas as karst geology. So we know where this soluble rocks are and so we know where we're going to have issues here. Now here's what the picture looks like in US 
okay? And once again, New York, not Texas, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but we have uh, a, a lot of this karst geology in the South, Florida, Georgia, into South Carolina. Here's the um, middle Midwest, Kentucky, Tennessee, parts of uh, Ohio into Iowa are underlain by this material. Now, it's a little sparser out here in the West, but we do have soluble rocks. That's how we got Lehman Caves in um, upper in, in northern Nevada and how, Cal, how Carlsbad Caverns formed in southern New Mexico. So quite extensive. And so in all these areas that you see in, in purple or blue or yellow, this is areas where, where sinkhole subsidence and springs can be a problem for us. Now, here are pictures of sinkholes. Um, this one opened uh, up in a residential area in Duluth, Minnesota in 2012. Once again, I can all I can say is I'm glad I'm not the owner of that blue car. This was a, a famous or infamous um, sinkhole that opened up in Florida in the early 80s. The reason I say infamous, you can't tell now, but there used to be a car dealership here. And so it opened up underneath a car dealership and swallowed the thing in uh, a matter of minutes. Uh, this one was one that opened up in Guatemala City. This got a lot of press. They called it a bottomless pit because they couldn't see the bottom. The bottom is there. It's not endless. It's not bottomless. Um, but you can see these problems that it caused. So in these um, urban areas, you're talking about damage to uh, water pipes uh, to buildings built on these structures to cars whatever's there now the good news is uh, and hopefully this works I promise nothing um, but uh, a couple years ago a uh, actual sinkhole opened up in a Louisiana um, bayou and they actually got it on tape Actually, this isn't working right now. So if you want, you can open uh, that up by yourself and take a look at it. So there's a Louisiana Bayou. It, it actually, you can see the thing. It swallows up trees and actually grows in size as somebody's taking the pictures. Now, our second problem deals with something called groundwater mining. Now, essentially, um, when you think of this, I want you to think of one word, overuse, okay? So what this means is we're withdrawing more water from an aquifer than can be replenished naturally from the infiltration of rainwater. Remember, that's how we recharge aquifers is through infiltration. So in essence, what we're doing is we're over-consuming. We're extracting more than can be replenished naturally. Now, what this creates is a localized drop in the water table right around the well. This localized drop is what is called a cone of depression. And so the harder we pump, the bigger that depression will become until some kind of equilibrium is reached between what is being extracted and what is flowing horizontally from other parts of the aquifer. The other way we can get it to stop is simply we turn off pumping and the water table rebounds. But here's the problem with this. It, the major issue is that it creates uh, a negative consequence as far as the productivity of our aquifers. So as the water is withdrawn and as the water table has that drop locally, the sediments that were once buoyed up by pore pressure. So as the groundwater exists in between those pore spaces, it actually exerts a pressure keeping the individual grains spread apart. So once we remove the water, the material becomes compacted and we lose 
that porosity, remember that's the amount of void space an aquifer has, we also lose the permeability. Remember how interconnected those pore spaces were. So essentially the material becomes compacted. Now here's the issue. If we stop pumping on that well and the water table rebounds, and it will rebound, we have forever negatively impacted porosity and permeability. We will never get back the original porosity and the original permeability. Even if we stop pumping, we have forever negatively impacted that aquifer. It will never be the same, even if we stop pumping. And so here's this big problem with overuse. We're negatively impacting the aquifers, and they're never going to be as productive as they once were. And that's a serious issue. Our third problem when it comes to um, groundwater sources or water sources is contamination. Now this is a very serious problem and we've talked about waste and, and, and mining and energy and how all those things can contaminate. But just let me remind you, anything that is purposely dumped or is accidentally spilled on the surface doesn't stay on the surface. It can infiltrate down under the influence of gravity and contaminate our aquifers. So in rural settings, think about all the pesticides, fertilizers, even animal waste that they spread on those fields can percolate or infiltrate downwards. In an urban setting, okay, we can have uh, accidental spills, leaking uh, underground storage tanks from gasoline, leaking underground um, sanitary landfills, uh, from mining, from energy, all of these things have the potential to some very dangerous chemicals or compounds that once again spilled or purposely put on the surface which then infiltrate down contaminating our aquifers. Now when it comes to contaminants we have two main types. The first type are called point source contaminants where the origin of the spill is limited to a small aerial uh, extent. So the reason, or at least I think why they call it point source, is you could go to a map and point to a single area and go, ah, that's where the spill originated from. Now examples of this would be leaking underground storage tanks. You can see this top picture here. This is at a gas station. This is, you can see one of those um, metal tanks that they have in, in, the under, in the subsurface. It sprung a leak. And so that's pure gasoline that's leaking into those sediments. Uh, leaking landfills, leaking septic systems. Those are for people in rural areas that aren't connected uh, to sewer system. A septic system is just a big concrete box where human waste goes in to break down. Well, those things can leak, once again, putting human waste into our groundwater system. Or the improper chemical disposal. Think about it. We've talked about it in this class. Remember the EPA, the federal EPA, US EPA, wasn't established until 1970. Think about that. Before we had that watchdog government agency, people dumped a lot of very dangerous things at the Earth's surface to save money in their disposal, all of those chemicals have quickly or slowly infiltrated into the ground surface. Now, if it's not a point source contaminant, it's a non-point source contaminant. Now, this simply means that the compounds or the chemicals leak into the subsurface over a much wider area. Whenever I think of non-point source contaminants, guys, I always think of agriculture because that's probably the biggest source of non-point contaminants in the US okay once again pesticides uh, herbicides fertilizers animal waste all of those things may be spread over um, hundreds thousands tens of thousands of acres and so you're talking about contaminating a much larger area I would also like to add that 
um, natural gas and oil extraction, and mining is also a fairly big source of non-point source contaminants. Our last, our fourth problem, guys, is, is probably the largest one, our projected freshwater short, shortages. Now, this is a map of shortages that are predicted by 2025, so a couple years. The red is what is called physical scarcity. That means they simply don't have enough water, physical water to give to their population. And so you can see, I especially like to point out, guys, the arid southwest, and we're seeing those problems here in Vegas, that's a big issue here. But we also have issues in North Africa, the Middle East, India, and parts of China. Once again, these are areas where you have large population density centers. And so you're talking about affecting billions of people. Now, the yellow is what is called economic water scarcity. That simply means that the country doesn't have enough economic resources to supply water to their population. And so once again, we go back to our pre-industrial countries. Remember Central and South Africa, guys. These are countries that are still in their pre-industrial phase. And once again, it's that economic inequality. So they simply don't have enough money to supply enough fresh water to their population. The pink that you see here is it's not yet at physical scarcity, but supplies are running out. And so you can see uh, Mexico, even parts of southern U.S. Uh, and the Eurasian continent, even South Africa, you're talking about areas that are approaching physical scarcity. And so when we look at this map, guys, this is probably the biggest problem facing us is we simply either don't have the economic resources or we don't have the fresh potable water to supply to our um, country. And so all four of those are fairly serious problems. So once again, we talked about uh, groundwater erosion, then groundwater mining or overuse, groundwater contamination, and now our water shortages. Those are the biggest four biggest problems facing us but let's be honest this is the biggest problem facing us today uh, as a world now when we talk about well what can we do is well we can turn to water conservation or by looking at alternative sources now we talked about conservation in this class guys remember this is a key concept Conservation, simply in one word, is to protect or save a limited natural resource like fresh potable water. Now, here's the problem. It goes back to the market, guys, economics. Um, conservation of a lot of things is linked to price. So we generally only save things when the price of something is high. For example, gold. Okay, you have a gold necklace that breaks, you don't throw it away, you save it and you recycle it. The problem is water's price is low. And so, especially in the valley, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I've noticed that water prices have started to come up as Lake Mead has continued to drop, but as long as you don't hit somebody in the wallet, they'll continue to waste things. And so this is why people still uh, continue to leave the water running when they brush their teeth or when they shave or they take 40 minute showers a and this is why Lake Mead is dropping so quickly now how can we actually conserve water well the first thing we can do is we can use something called gray water or recycled water for non potable or non drinking purposes now, we call it gray water, not because it's gray in color, simply because it's between white water, which is fresh or potable water, and black water. Black water has human waste in it. So a lot of this we can use for irrigation, construction, things that don't necessarily need fresh potable water for. 
we can use more efficient practices, particularly in agriculture. Today, uh, in most places, especially in the Midwest, even up in Utah, they use this, in, in, in through California, they use something called the center head pivot irrigation system, where you have a series of pipes that are anchored to the center of the field. And these pipes are on wheels. And so you can actually wheel the pipes 360 degrees around your agricultural field. Now these things put out a couple thousand gallons of water a minute. Remember, during the summer months where they mainly use this, you're talking about 67% of that water is usually lost in the form of evaporation because of uh, high temperatures. And so we know this is extremely inefficient. Why do we continue to use these practices? It's all about cost. It would require probably billions of dollars to switch to more efficient means. And a more efficient means or a more efficient practice is the use of something called drip irrigation, which is what we use for landscaping in the valley where you have a series of pipes, you release a certain amount of water every day and it's released right into the root system of the plants. So instead of spraying it willy-nilly on a field, hoping that it's absorbed by the plants, you're delivering it underground, which means it's not gonna evaporate, and you're delivering it right where the plant needs, right into the root system. Much more efficient, but once again, if we were to switch to something like that, it would require upfront billions of dollars in order to switch. And so water's cheap, and so we waste it on those inefficient practices. Uh, other efficient practices are desert landscaping in arid environments. I always get so mad when I drive past somebody with grass. If you want grass, go live in Illinois. In the valley, you should have desert landscaping. Rocks and drought resistant vegetation, things that don't need native species that don't need a lot of water. And yet people still putting in grass. Now, if we can't conserve, if we can't use recycled water, if we can't use more efficient practices, okay, if we can't get the market to increase the cost so that we save more, then we need to find alternative sources. And this is where desalination comes in, where we take seawater, we remove the dissolved solids, and we get out fresh potable water. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But let's continue with this discussion on conservation. So let's start with gray water. And once again, it's called gray water not because it's gray in color, but because it's between black water, anything with human waste in it, right here, and white water, anything that is fresh, potable water. Now, 70 to 90% of what you use in your household can be captured, cleaned, and reused. And in the valley, it is, guys. Okay? Dishwasher, washing machine, your shower, your sinks all you use that water it goes to a water treatment facility where it's then cleaned and returned to be reused again and so this essentially think of gray water as as recycling we're capturing used water cleaning it and reusing it again here is this efficient practices so here's drip irrigation i know you've seen it Okay, so you have a series of pipes, usually PVC, but you can have, uh, it can be stainless steel, mostly PVC though, or plastic. Um, and these pipes run right along where you plant your uh, vegetation. And so they're usually perforated right where at the each plant. And so you have some kind of tank that delivers water usually once or twice a day so you use a lot less and you're delivering it right to where the plant needs it. So instead of spraying it willy-nilly like those center head pivot irrigation systems, you're delivering it right to where the plant needs it and you're using a lot less. 
Now, once again, the market has a, a, a huge, is a driving factor in water conservation and in using more efficient things, it would require uh, a high upfront cost. Now, if we can't conserve, we need to turn to alternative sources. And this is where desalination comes into it. Now, here's the problem with taking seawater and removing the, the salt, essentially, is it requires quite a lot of energy and it's actually fairly expensive. So both of those things is, are why desalination is used in other parts of the world, but not a lot in the US, okay? So if you take a look, over half of the desalination plants are found in the Middle East. You'll see this large concentration here, also in Northern Africa uh, and in Western Europe as well. Think about what the Middle East has, money from oil and natural gas, and think about what they don't have, fresh water. So that makes sense. 17% uh, are found in North America, that would be US and Canada primarily, although, although there are desalination plants in Mexico, Europe, Asia, and Africa. This is the world's largest desalination plant right here, found in Israel. They can actually produce a couple million gallons of fresh water a day. That's a fairly sizable setup. Now, the 250 plants in the US, most of those are small scale. The two largest, or I should say the three largest that I know about, one is in Tampa Bay, Florida. The other is in San Diego, California. And then there's one in Texas, I think Galveston, but don't quote me on it. Those are probably the largest plants in the US and they're nowhere close to the one in Israel. Okay, once again, Middle East have money, but don't have potable water. Now there's two processes in which we can take the dissolved impurities or the salt out of salt water. The first one, which is also the most widely used, is filtration. This is when you have a series of filters, okay, and the first filters have the largest openings, the last filters have the smallest ones. So you remove the large particles first, then the second largest, then the third largest. By the time it goes through the last filter, all you have left is fresh water and the salts have actually been caught or captured by the filters. Now, this is the most widely used because it's probably the easiest and cheapest. Now, you do have to replace your filters every so often because they will be clogged with brine or saline that dissolves stuff that's left behind. But it's easy to set these up large scale and it's a little cheaper than the second method, which is distillation. This is, you take salt water, you heat it to its boiling point, the water changes phase, but the salt can't. So you then take the water vapor, condense it, and you would then uh, have fresh water, and then the salt would be left behind. It's hard to set this up on large scale, a little more expensive, which is why, once again, I would say most of your desalination plants are filtration. They use that series of filters. Now, I wanted to leave you with a final thought. And um, if, or, or if you are one of those horrible, evil people that leave the water running when you brush your teeth, you waste about two gallons of water. Now, I did the math on this. That amounts to almost 1,500 gallons per person per year are wasted. Now, just imagine if all almost 335 million of us in the U.S. were to do that simple thing of turning off the water when we brush our teeth. This is the amount that we could save, ladies and gentlemen. That is not a small number. And so I highly encourage you to, you know, what I do is, is I wet my toothbrush, turn off the water, brush my teeth thoroughly, rinse it. You don't waste it by leaving it running. Or don't leave the water running when you shave, men or women, okay? Wet your razor, turn off the water, shave, rinse it off. 
or to take shorter showers, okay? I, I don't know what a 40 minute shower gets you, but I think you can be just as clean if you take a 10 to 15 minute shower. And so I highly encourage all of you to, there are things around your house that you can save water, okay? Uh, do larger loads for laundry, uh, larger loads for the dishwasher so you're not wasting all that water. Uh, when you wash your car, it doesn't have to be done every week, maybe once a month. There are things that you can do that can save water. And remember, in the valley, we really need everybody to chip in and do their parts to save water. Okay. Once again, if you've been to Lake Mead, you know how bad it is. And it's only going to get worse as more and more people move into the valley. And so that is the end of our water resources discussion.